went to a friend's uh, birthday party and I met somebody who was involved with Charity Water and was just about to go off to Ethiopia with Scott um, and you know do a, a, a field trip. Um, at the time, I have to confess, I had never heard of Charity Water, but the, the way the, the person described their whole uh, operation was very uh, uh, appealing to me and just, just sounded amazing. 800 million people don't have clean water. Well, I don't know what 800 million of anything looks like, let alone people without water. So I wanted to put faces and names and really understand what it was like to live without access to clean water. I was born in Philadelphia. I, I, I never had to think about drinking dirty water. The water crisis for my friends was a $10 bottle of Pellegrino at the club. This is what it looks like out there. 15-year-olds named John Bosco drinking from a swamp in the middle of his village. There are lots of ways to bring clean water to people around the world. Sometimes it's a hand dug well, like in Liberia. Sometimes it's a drilled well. Sometimes rainwater harvesting or, or spring catchments or pond sand filters or bio sand filters. At its cheapest, it looks like this, a $65 filter. It's the program in Cambodia. There's actually a lot of arsenic in the groundwater. But you can take surface water and you can clean it. So I went straight home from the party and Googled charity water and felt that I needed to somehow get, in, get involved with them. So I contacted them and really have uh, you know, been involved in some way or another since then. So, here we are backstage, and we are right now in the office that's called JK, and it's the management office. And over here we have Alex, who's, um, I'm not quite sure what Alex is doing, but I believe he could be doing something called work. Now I'm going to walk you over and pass you over to Ginny, who handles all of our press and public relations. Um, and she's going to guide you downstairs to the stage and show you around backstage and introduce you to a few of the people who work with us there. Ginny? Ginny! Hello, I'm Ginny. <laughs> I do uh, tour press and publicity, and I work for the lovely Baron Kessler. Um, follow me, we're going to take you guys to the stage. This is the inside of the Ziggo Dome in Amsterdam. Here is Sean Saucier, our Depeche Mode stage manager. Hello. How are you? All right. Uh, welcome to stage left of uh, Depeche Mode backstage. Uh, this is the quick change area. Uh, Pro Tools rig. This is where Carrie, our programmer, does all the um, extra sound effects that you don't hear or see being played on stage. Passing Pro Tools, we come to Monitor World. This board is a minus XL8. Then coming over onto stage right, we have uh, Guitar World and Drum World. Uh, this is where all the guitars get tuned and restrung. Heading down here, we start getting into Lighting World. If you've seen the show, you've seen some of the lighting grid move up and down. And uh, it's all done by this system called Kinesis. So this is where we um, control all the lights. Uh, this is called Dimmer World. Now here is uh, what we call Video Village. Um, this is where the director and his crew uh, create the visuals of the show. Um, basically everything's done live other than some of the content that we have from Anton Corbin. All right, and here's the main man, uh, Anthony King. He's our front of house engineer. He's the one that uh, makes uh, everything sound great. I have the fantastic Midas XL8 which is the console we use to mix the sound with, which is, for the general public out there, the sound that they hear in the audience, so when they come to the show, the sound they're hearing all comes from here. Mm -hmm. 